I, the Lord, would say to you, I am calling you to me. I have many things to show you about the future, but I hold them in my hands. They are a mystery to the enemy, which you dwell with. Therefore, look up. Haven't I told you to look up? And come unto me, those of you that are weary, when you're full of yourself, come unto me, for I want to show you things to come. Yes, all things are in my hands, and all things are set. Therefore, you cannot change when I come, when I gather you. Therefore, look up, reach out, and help others find me, saith God. For I am meek, and I am lowly, and I desire to teach you my way. Therefore, be not thinking of yourself. Think of me, and I as I think of you. And the Lord, I, I seen a picture how much he loves us, how much he cares for us. And it seems like when we go to him, we only bring problems or a situation. He wants us just to talk, to let our hair down and just be with him. We receive that word, Lord. Everyone receive that word? Amen. Okay. Are you ready to get in the word? All right. Are you ready to take notes? I see that BJ's got our note taken out there. Amen. All right, so Father, receive the word that I have to give. Lord, receive as we teach and share. Help us to have good listening ears, not just to hear the sound of the word and not just acknowledge as we, we love the word. Help us to practice it, Lord. It's not doing it that gets us in trouble. It's looking at our own self in the mirror that gets us in trouble. So Lord, help us look up. Help us to be filled with ex expectation in your word. In Jesus' name, everyone said... All right, so blessings to you. We're going to talk about prayer again, but we're going to call this subtitle The War Room, Prayer Strategies. Now, the first thing my wife said to me when she's typing, are you copying me? I said, I said I'm not copying here. God wants me to give you a boost for what your journey is going to be. You ladies are going on a retreat. You're being caught away in the spirit. And so when you go, I don't want you to just go to look at the beach and all those wonderful things. You know, that's good. Go to be with God. Go to let God talk to you about something special. And so I talk to God. God always gives me my sermons and the themes of my sermons. And I say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to teach on prayer? The war room, he says. <laughs> that's so cool. Because actually, do you know where your war room is called your prayer closet, right? Everyone say, my prayer closet is the war room. Now, I'm going to get ahead of myself for just a minute. When you go into your prayer closet and you shut the door, you meet with your father in the secret place, right? Yep. Then your prayer closet is moved, listen carefully, is moved up into the spirit and before the throne of God. Now you're in the real war room. Now, let me ask you, can the devil hang around up there? Can the devil come into the spirit? No. So that's why it's so important that you learn to fight God's way without getting entangled in it so you don't get beat up. Your flesh can't handle the devil. That's why you crucify it. Get it out of the way right away. And your reasoning realm is not smart enough to outsmart them so you don't dwell in your own reasoning realm. You don't dwell about, you don't be thinking about things and worrying about things, just like Jesus said not to, because it paints pictures and makes strongholds. Say amen. But we war in the throne room with God where we can't be touched, nor can we feel the stress of the war. We can't be targeted. It's when we get out of the war room and the enemy says, oh, what would you pray about? And somebody said, what's going on in your life? And then we kind of leak it out. How many here know? You've ever heard this? How many here has ever been in the Navy? Where's Alan? In the Navy, they have a little statement. They say, loose lips sink ships. In, in church, loose lips sink churches. Loose lips sink crush God's work. You see, we don't need that. Say amen. That's why God forbids us, and I'm going to get my lesson because it's short. God forbids us to comment or criticize another believer. Do you, are you aware of that? And I know it's hard 
because there's some people you wonder what they're doing, okay? I have to be careful because I love the family of God. Can you say amen? And not all of them are exactly where you think they should be. So the wisdom of God would say, don't use your conversation a blessing. Turn it around and criticize something. Oh, and it's so good. I watch Huckleby. But when you get going on that, you can criticize sometimes. So make sure that the spirit keeps you in check, that you don't start railing on your country, railing on things, making fun of things, because that's what the devil likes. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because it's not this comment itself. It's the act of commenting over and over and again like that. It's the habit of the negativity. The habit of doing those things creates and sets, listen, sets a law in motion. That law in motion sometimes can't be changed. So people's habits are built in their young life. And often, you know how hard it is to overcome some of those young habits. So say, oh, me. I'm switching mics now. You ready? That's coming for them. All right. I think we got it. All right. Super. Thanks. Okay. We're going to cover four areas and then read our paragraph. You ready? Four areas we're going to cover in prayer. The war room prayer strategies. So number one, our covenant approach to God. Everyone say, my covenant approach to God. Number two, the real war room. I kind of let it out already. The throne of God. Number three, how to engage the enemy. And actually, how not to. And then fourthly, being salt. We need to be salty. Can you say amen? Salt's unique. I'm going to take a minute to say it. Salt does a whole bunch of things. Number one, though, salt adds life and flavor to the food. You are the salt of the earth. Now you're getting it. Your job is to bring to the earth life and flavor of God. That's called our witness. How do people read you? As a crab? Are you a happy, dancy person? Be that way whether you feel like it or not. Maturity is when you know to do something, you do it, even if you don't feel like doing it. Like come to church. Many Christians today, Lord, okay, I'll share that. They hear words. They hear voices. Don't listen in your head, voices. God doesn't talk to your head. It's boring. Ah. He talks into the core of your pit of your stomach. And it sounds still and small. And you have to develop in hearing God's voice. But some people jump on whatever comes popping in. Do this. And they think it's a God idea. They do it and it crumbles all before them. What happened? You listen to the wrong voice. Don't be listening for voices. Can you say amen? The biggest voice God has is called the word of God. Say amen. And then any other thing has to be lined up with the word of God. All right, I don't know how, but I had, God wanted me to say that part. All right, so you ready? Okay, let's read our, our paragraphs. All right, first of all, when we talk, how many know that God wants us to talk, right? Truckers have truckers' language. Doctors seem to have doctors' language. You know, some ethnic groups have their own yank a hank a bunk a bunk type of language. But Christians are supposed to have their language. Can you say amen? Our language is full of life, full of positive, full of encouragement. That's not to ignore what the problem is. It's just not always talking about your always. So says, let your speech always be with grace. Seasoned with what? Ah, wonderful salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So you see, we're supposed to be salt. Say amen. Second Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4. I charge you, therefore, Timothy, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and those that have died at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. What are we to preach? 
If it doesn't agree with the word, if it doesn't preach the word, it's not preaching Jesus, then find something else, change the subject. Be ready in season, out of season. Convince, convince people. Hey, you need to get Jesus. You need to find the Lord. Rebuke, rebuke the devil. Exhort, come on people, let's go, let's go. With all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's teaching, we're doctrines teaching. But according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. How so, Pastor Kerry? That teach what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. And they will turn from their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Okay? You can read Romans chapter 1 if you want to really see what that can do. Because in Romans 1, it says, had they, they known God, but they didn't choose to keep him as God in their heart. So they changed creatures that were created by God into sticks and stones. They made them their gods so they could serve themselves. Therefore, God turned them over to a reprobate mind so that they would carry out what they're doing. I want to tell you the age that we're living in is that it seems like everybody ate a crazy pill. Go back three, maybe four years, and everything just went off to left field. Now, I'm going to explain this real quickly. Went off to left field. Now, we're talking about just regular human beings, not Christians, but most of them too. And, and the COVID thing came out. Remember that? And that sort of corralled everybody, either wear a mask, don't wear a mask, take a shot, not take a shot. The idea, remember, there's something greater than the flaws of humanity. Remember, everybody has to follow somebody. So if we're not following God, who are we following? Now, we don't want to just, some people are following other people, and other people are going the wrong way. So if you look, Satan has taken the system of this world, and he's corralling and controlling people so that he could bring in the Antichrist. These are the times of the ends. This is when the Antichrist is going to come in on the scene. He's going to be a beast-like, has no regard for human beings. We have a lot of pictures in the scripture about it. In the last, time, last days, perilous times will come. In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. It goes through a whole thing in 2 Timothy 3. But then also in Timothy, it says that in the last days, there'll be a, a spirit of delusion and deception. There'll be people telling you you can't get married. So they stay celibate, and yet they still fall in sex because we are made to be with each other. You see, when you find the right partner, you don't keep from loving each other. You see, but this, remember, the devil is oppressive. So he'll play religious games with people. And then in the last days, religion, on behalf of what they say is God, which is not, will begin to tell people to do things they can't stop from doing. Causing a bondage, causing deterioration and corruption. Take a look around you, just briefly. Everything is broken, breaking all over. Why? Because they're yielding their self to the philosophy of the serpent. Hello? Remember the serpent came in the garden in the, there in chapter 3 of Genesis? We can't ignore him. He has a whole system of corruption that he's been playing for thousands of years on humanity, made in God's image after God's. And we know he's the tempter, the destroyer, but we know he's been defeated. Say amen. amen. Well, then why are so many people falling privy or listening to him? Because the church is not preaching pure truth. They're divided up because we're supposed to be the salt of the earth, remember? Uh-huh. And salt preserves. Everyone say flavor and then preserves. How did they make beef jerky in the olden days, keep the meat from rottening? Salt. Salt keeps the earth from rotten. So we add flavor, Sherry, and we keep the sinners from rotting. We keep our family in God so they don't rot. 
Are you hearing me? I'm not talking to you, but we do. We put them in our hands in the prayer on the altar. We make sure that they know how their walk's doing. We have some challenged people, and I love every one of them. I take them. But at the same time, moms and dads sit down, ask them what they know about Jesus, and don't assume anything. Jeez, remember we're living in a doofus world full of a serpent doofus that's controlling us like cattle. Not, I mean us generally. That's why God called us out of darkness into light. But you know what? We're going back into darkness because that's what we know what to do. We're acting as if we know something when we really don't know. God says, come unto me. What was that word he gave us this morning? Point one, our covenant approach to God. Now, I hear a lot of people just now beginning to pray correctly. Not you, but you listen. I, I like to listen at a baseball game when somebody opens in prayer. And, you know, maybe at a graduation, maybe they still do that, maybe they don't. But at my graduations, they prayed and they asked G in Jesus' name, hello. And I love to hear how people pray, not because I'm analyzing it, because we want to make sure that we approach God according to the covenant. Can you say amen? First point I want to make, you have to say something to cause the covenant to be in operation. So God gave us a name above every name. What's his name? In every language in the world, they use Jesus, even though it sounds different than our English language. Say amen. But they'll try, the enemy will try to get him to use every other name for God and those beautiful names. But only the name of Jesus kicks the devil's booty every time you use it. Hello. And you notice, Scott will tell you, you don't cuss in Buddha. Oh, Buddha. Oh, Krishna. Oh, Chris, Chris, Krishna. No, they use God and Jesus. The devil's a mocker. That's why God hates mocking. The devil is a mocker, and he'll get you to try to mock God by not doing it the right way. Now, God is not legalistic. He hears everybody's prayers. But when you come to the Father, covenant approach in Jesus' name. So the covenant approach to God is Father in Jesus' name. Everyone say that. Or pray, Father, and pray your prayer, and then I finish that in Jesus' name. As long as you invoke the name of Jesus. Why? Because it seals the prayer's delivery. Of course, God hears you instantly and you're in heaven. But it also ensures the answer. So you approach God in Jesus' name. Now, what if you, you feel unclean and you're dirty and you might, God might not hear you? You're approaching in your analyzation already. Just always say when you approach God, Father, I come in Jesus' name. Cleanse me from any unrighteousness or anything that would hinder my understanding and walking with you. Pretty easy, isn't it? Because you cover everything there, and you don't have to analyze what could it be. I wonder what I did now. Colin, I wonder what I did now. Don't do that. <laughs> I hope he's watching. This is great. Now, you understand what I'm saying? So the covenant approach to God is the way God asked us. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures there. Number one, in the New Testament, we go into our prayer closet, close the door. Why? Letting God know he's our only attention. Please don't bring your complaints in there. One time, again, I'll tell you, I was praying. I thought I was praying. And I had two kids, full-time job at Boeing and pastoring. And I was just, oh, God. And I was telling God all this stuff and everything. And God interrupts me. Did you ever have God interrupt your prayer? I'm praying around, actually. And I said, God? And he says, yeah. And he said, and I was like, why did you interrupt my prayer? Anyway, shows our flesh. And he says, what are you doing? I says, I'm praying. He says, no, you're not. You're complaining. I need you to pray what my will and word is. I need you to praise me and thank me. So you free up around you. You're focused on the right things. Your mind goes up into a higher level, and I can speak to you and get your attention. <laughs> Please don't fill me in the stuff I can see that's going on. And I'm just hamming it up a little bit. We always want to state the obvious. 
No, call the things that are not as though they are. Say, oh, yeah. All right, so let's look at the covenant approach to God. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus said to them, I am the way. Who's the way? If you're going to get to the Father, how do you go through? If you're going to do anything good for God, what are you going to go through? There you go. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. So guess what? Satan's got everybody into every kind of religion there is. Got us praying. Oh, Father, if it be your will in your name. Now, God hears that, but can he answer that? Lord, I want you to heal me only if it be your will. Please be quiet. You have no idea what the will of God is. If you did, you wouldn't say those things. Does your family know what the will of God is? Give them a track. When are you ladies going to carry tracks and little things you can lay at restaurants wherever you go? If not, we got tons back there. Say amen. Let's go to John 14, farther down, verse 12 through 13. Most assuredly, Jesus is saying, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to be with my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, see the approach to God through the covenant. You're going through Jesus. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Next scriptures, John 16, 23 through 24. And it says, in that day you will ask me nothing. See, we're in this day. We, don't, we, don't, we talk to Jesus throughout the day, but we approach the Father according to the covenant. Say amen. It's not a legalistic thing. It's a proper thing. It's honoring the Father. We want to honor the Father. Okay? We're lifting his son. So we come to the Father in Jesus' name. What you ask anything in my name, whatever you ask the Father in my name, that will he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will what? Receive that your joy may be what? God wants your joy full. The reason why Christians have a, such a hard time is they don't get with God quick enough to incubate. Everyone say, I'm a seed before God. See, you're developing before God. God came into your seed, and now you're a new creature. Say amen. You got an old shell around you. Everyone pitch your flesh. Say amen. So the new creature's growing up, like we've said many times, up out of the old shell. But folks, some people won't let go of the shell. That shell is still around them. And there's still Jesus in their heart. But all you can see is their crusty old shell. All right, let's move right along. So watch this. And he says, and that, that your joy be made full. A couple of points. Church, now we have an everlasting covenant with Almighty God set in the heavens. There is a lot of power at our disposal through prayer. Two, finally remember, it is God in us who does the work and has the power. We release him through prayer and words in Jesus' name. Thirdly, we speak the word that Jesus goes to work. We speak the word, and the word is God. God is the word, and the word, Jesus, goes to work. Say amen. That's why God didn't want to hear your complaints. We release Jesus' step. Now listen, once you pray and once you do these things, you release Jesus, step back. Don't personally get engaged with those things you're praying with. Hello? Some people are so engaged when they're praying, and it's actually them, just like somebody's beat in the air. No, you release God according to the word. You step back in God and let God do his thing. You rest and enjoy the presence of God. There is no stress and there's no weariness in fighting and engaging the devil the way God designed it. You see, the bomb does the bomb. You don't throw yourself on the bomb with the bomb. You release God. Say amen. And he knows what to heal, what to do. He needs, knows who to deliver. 
You just speak the words, and like a nozzle, you're blasting. Have you ever sandblasted? That's a lot of fun. Not, I did it once. All this sand coming through this velocity, ripping all the paint, making it look, the metal look shiny. You're sandblasting with the word. You see, the trouble is, everyone laugh at me. Many Christians don't know enough of it to blast in much of anything. And not only that, if you look at it, if you don't believe me, they're blasting each other. How sad. Listen, I got a lot of faults, but don't spend your time blasting me. Spend your time praying for me. Hello. Like I'm praying for you. And that the church be united in winning this planet to the Lord. Say amen. Instead of hiding foxholes like David's time when Goliath is trying to yell. All right. Thirdly, we speak the word and Jesus goes to work. Fourthly, this is a trap. God, the devil of this world wants us engaged in the affairs of this world. Hello? That's why we pray before we do anything. Making sure our timing, making sure we don't step in the dog doo-doo of the traps. So the enemy's got them laid out everywhere. And he says, when it comes to man, don't trust mankind. Did you know the Bible says that? Jeremiah 17, 5 through 7. But rather, lift your trust up to the Lord, and the Lord will help select who to trust and who not, who to marry and who not, what to do business with and who not. Can you say amen? I thought forever God is in charge of our life. Then he should be making the major decisions. And if we never go to him about him, then we're going to step out where we don't need to one time or two and going to wish we don't like the results we got. We got the idea, but we didn't get the timing right. Oh, come on now. I'm talking about me too. You want to get everything right. That's why we, we, we're with God. That's why we let God take the lead and the charge of our life. Jesus is Lord, right? That means he's the Lord in charge of our life. You don't decide to leave him periodically to go do your own thing. If you were married, which you're supposed to be to Jesus, then you'd be divorced real quick. If I just up and, and travel and came back a couple weeks later, oh, honey, I didn't tell you. That's Christians, we are married to Christ. If you haven't, then you're just dating him. Get serious. But you're married to Christ. So when you start taking your life back, you are divorcing yourself. You're ripping yourself out of his hands. And we're not doing that. It's a mean thing. It's just a bad habit. Hello? It's a bad habit that we need to wash away in our time and presence with God. All right. Let's go on to point two. Thank God, Pastor Gary. So you got the approach to God. It has to be the covenant. One more point. Folks, as much as I, I think this is cute... Okay, as much as what I'm about to say is, is a, a good and noble thing, you cannot covenantly approach God in your head. Sorry. Now, I believe God hears what you're thinking. Believe me, Satan cannot. But what the devil does is he tells us if we just think in our heart, in our head, now listen, our prayers. They're wonderful. You can have some wonderful prayers in your head, praise God, and God hears them. But in order for him to covenant with you, you've got to say them. You didn't think Jesus into your heart. Oh, Lord, did you hear my prayer of salvation? No. Well, you're not, I'm not praying to you. Well, of course you're not. But you've got to create the covenant. Believe in your heart, speak with your mouth. Believe in your heart, speak with your mouth. If you believe with your heart, then you should speak with your mouth. We are a product of what we begin and continually say. We are. If you say you can't, you won't. I'm down, I'm down, I'm down, I'm down. Keep on talking. You might set things in motion and loss that will keep you bound up. Hello? Hello? You're saying and you're talking is very powerful or God would have never said it was. All right, point two. The real war room. Can you say amen? 
What's a real war room, everyone? I've got to get my, my mouth to work. It's the throne room of God, isn't it? The real war room is our secret place in the throne room of God. So go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse 8. It's talking about after Jesus rose again from the dead. He also talks in that chapter that he didn't give the earth to an angel. Who's he talking about? Lucifer. But he gave it to his son. Say amen. All right. And who lives in our heart, right? And who we live in his heart, right? So the earth and the fullness thereof belong to us through inheritance in Christ. Now listen to what it says. But to the son, he says, your throne of God, your throne, O God. He called, Father God calls him God. And forever and forever, a scepter of being right or scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. Everyone say, I dwell in the kingdom of God. I dwell in the kingdom of heaven. Did you know there's a difference? Kingdom of God is the parent of the kingdom of heaven. They're both of the same. <coughs> Excuse me. Your child is a part of you, and you are a part of your child. So the kingdom of God is the whole thing, a reign and rule of God. Lucifer fell, Adam fell, okay? Fell down on the earth, all the oppression. So when Jesus rose from the dead and sent Pentecost come, a spiritual kingdom came into the earth like never before. That's some mighty rushing wind with the Holy Spirit and came up and set his dominion, power, and rule. Part of the kingdom got snapped off and brought it in the earth to destroy the works of the devil. Say amen. That's called the kingdom of heaven. So you'll read in your Bible, some of the modern translations forget, but the kingdom of heaven is just a part of the kingdom of God. While the kingdom of God is the whole thing. So when you hear the kingdom of God, it's okay. When you hear the kingdom of heaven, that means that part that dwells in the earth to, to, to be our supply house. Say it's the Costco for a Christian. I don't want to say that. Listen, listen. The kingdom of heaven in the earth is a warehouse with every gift, every spiritual item, the workings of the Holy Spirit, has everything that God is, was, all of it's in that warehouse. Hello. And the only ones that can enter that warehouse are those that come to in the name of Jesus. When you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, that warehouse is open to you. Say, Amen. And God says, Okay. What do you, what do you need here? Oh, well, I don't know. But see, that's what happened. He opens up that to us, and now we need to get in there and let the Holy Spirit pick and choose for us. This is the life in Christ, the life in God that we have. Religion doesn't paint this picture. So everyone say, I have an unlimited credit card to Costco. <laughs> His name is God. So in the kingdom of heaven, you dwell. But in order for you to see it, you've got to be in the spirit. Say amen. And yes, guess what? That's another place where Satan can't go. He can't go to Costco. He doesn't have a membership. Get it? You have a membership in Jesus Christ. You're to dwell in the kingdom, and you're to let the Holy Spirit walk you through and learn what the God wants you and how to perform and be the witness. Our faith does not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power and demonstration of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. All right, so are you with me? So we're in the real war room. Is there devil there? Can he hear your words? No, no, no. Who are you before? God. Who's sitting in you and who's sitting next to you? Jesus. So I'd say you're pretty good in the war room. Now, here's what we don't do. We don't sit down, and we don't let God help us aim. You see, we have a weapon in the war room, because it's a war over the lost souls of human beings. You're sitting down in the throne room of God. When you pray, you set yourself to use the word of God, their weapons, and tactical weapons, 
you ask for his wisdom, and you literally become a soldier in that place. You have armor on you. Now, I've said this last week. I'll say it again. The armor is the armor of God. Everyone say the armor of God. God is light. So this armor is lit up. Folks, how many know that your phone is lit up as long as you have a charge in it? And again, I was asked years ago, I, can't, I, I remember that when I heard another phrase on this, and a, a person asked, well, Pastor Jerry, how often do you put on the armor of God? And most people will answer, every time I need to. No, wrong answer. You say, I never took it off. Because you can't take the armor of God off. It doesn't fall off. It doesn't drop off. It doesn't run the other way. The armor is Jesus. Say amen. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision of the flesh. Romans eleven thirteen on. It says put on the armor of light. Who can't stand light? And your flesh. So. You get with God, you realize that you're plugged into God, you're being charged up to God. God doesn't want to hear your complaining or anything. He wants you to be receiving his instructions. Hello? Lord, I don't need to tell you what I'm going through. I just need help with the wisdom that you have. You see the different way? Don't tell God what's going on. Because every time you talk that way, you paint pictures in your mind and it seats itself. It's kind of like super glue. Don't touch it. Is that a good enough illustration? All right, we can make that just as short by itself. Could be only seconds long. Anyway, that's just fun to do. I, I like to paint pictures as much as possible. Don't touch what you gave to God. If I gave God the problem, God keeps it. Oh, but when I start talking about it, it seems to come back to me. Keep your mouth shut as much as possible. You're not terribly sinning. You're just complicating matters. All right, let's move on. All right, now... No, so listen to this. Very familiar. I want to read it to you. It's Matthew 6, 5. But you, see me, when you pray, go into your room or a pretend room. Shut everything out and meet with your father in the secret place. That's the spirit realm. When you meet with him in the secret place, the spirit of God whisks you. I don't know how he does it. You're physically here, but you can allow God mentally and spiritually to lift you into vision before the throne. So actually, you're seated here and seated before the throne at the same time. And you're cloaked. Everyone say, I'm cloaked. Satan cannot hear. That's why when you're around a bunch of people and they're talking about things and you don't like what they're thinking and they're trying to get in and dig at things, you say, Father, in Jesus' name. You just whisper it. Watch God go right in there and straighten all that out. Stand back and be amazed. I have many times, probably tens of thousands of times, done that. Because I know I work with a God who needs for me to release him. I say I work and love a God who needs for me to pray him out to release him. He can't just push himself on your children. you got to pray him on him. Say Amen. Father, so and so, get them. You know exactly what they need, how they think, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. So I turn them over and put them on your altar, and now I release their angels, find those demons. I take those demons, watch me, and I grab them in Jesus' name, and I put them behind the curtain, and I bind them there so they can never come back out in Jesus' name. There's another great short for you. Now, Let's go on a little further. Look at me. Hebrews chapter 4. Go with me. This tells us we can come boldly before the throne, and actually that's what we do. We go, Father, in the name of Jesus, we shut the world out, and we just worship a little bit. And let me go through the, what we call the model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Lord, don't allow us to be led into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Lord, for you truly in Jesus' name, have a divine kingdom that's forever and forever, forever, and amen. Now, those are stations, but notice how I brought it into the new covenant prayer in Jesus' name. First thing you always do when you approach God is you get a little cleansing and you let God know how precious he is to you. Don't approach him with your head because you're going to blow him in boredom. You approach him, say, Lord, help me to be a child. I want to know something, that you're just the most precious thing to me. And when you do that, that's hallowing his name. Say amen. So I come to you in the name of Jesus and I just want to lavish on you. I don't want anything in particular, God. I just want to hug your neck and kiss your cheek and tell you you're the best thing in my life. That's hallowing him. And then it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's vision. Because God wants you to know there's nothing bad in heaven. He wants us to start believing for the positive, the things that are like in heaven on earth. So who are the ones that pour the uh, heaven stuff down here on earth? You and I. He pours himself out as we speak him. Can you say amen? amen? So speak him. Don't speak problems. You go around your flowers. I'm, Linda, Linda knows this. She goes around her flowers and she probably says, oh, you're beautiful in Jesus' name. And all that life is coming on them and just getting all over them. If she hasn't done that, she's probably going to do it now. Hello. And you know what responds to that? All of creation, it says in Romans 8, all of creation. Flowers, birds, everything, are waiting to hear God's voice, the manifestation of the sons of God, it says. That's when you and I get mature enough to speak Jesus, speak God. Say amen. Let's go on. I got more stuff to share with you. I just want to get into it, okay? So we come boldly before the throne of grace, whereby we may obtain grace and help in the time of need. Say amen. Third point. Now, to in, how do we engage the enemy? Very important. Remember something. He designed your flesh, and he's got trigger points in it. So you do not want to live for God in the flesh or the natural. You don't want to war against an enemy in the flesh or the natural. So what he'll do is you'll see a problem, but immediately we try to go to solve it, and then we start to pray about it, but we didn't go to God about it first. Go to God and say, give me what I need to pray so I can handle this situation. Say amen. Okay? You're not putting armor on again. You're going in and letting him charge up the device. It's, it's called Jesus Christ on you. Now, I want to tell you something. How many here will have one of those wonderful phones? Doesn't work well if it's not charged up, does it? Well, the machinery you have around you is spiritual machinery. It's actually a living Lord Jesus Christ. But he has equipment. Say equipment. Equip you with equipment, it says. So this equipment is of God and has to function according to God's principles. So if you don't plug it in, get it with God, it's not going to function right. What's going to appear is you. I don't want to appear face to face with the devil. I don't ever want to do that. I did that once. I had to step back and let God handle it. Never get up and enter your day without letting Jesus lead the way. Hello. Get up, you pray, you present yourself. Don't present the dirt. Just say, wash it off, Lord. I'm presenting myself. Do whatever you need to do in me. Get me ready. Only takes a few minutes. Then worship him, love him. Then get on your day. And then find that time sometime every day where you actually can meet with God because we're going to show you some really important strategies. Are you with me? Have I lost any of you? I hope not. Okay. All right. How to engage the enemy. Second Corinthians, please. Chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. I'm looking for my juice, so I'm going to have to step down here. This is real professional. It's actually my cereal and everything else in here. Did you find the place? 2 Corinthians 10. Beautiful chapter, but it says, for though we walk in the flesh, how many know we walk in the natural? 
We do not war according to the natural or the flesh. Say amen. See, he's saying something very wise here. Now remember, when they translate this, they're trying to make sense out of it. So they might miss a few of the Lord. That's why we had an amplified Bible. To amplify some of those rich things that seem to be overlooked. Okay? So he says, we do not wrestle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare. Weapons are things, people. They're things. Okay. The weapons of our warfare are not natural, carnal, but mighty. Notice the word in. The very key words, an in word. If you're in here, you're not out there. If you're in Christ, you're not in the flesh. So you have to be in the state of mind of being in when you war. The state of mind of being in. Remember, you're in the throne room. You're seated here, but you're in the throne room. You have that state of mind. You're in Christ. When you do that, here's what happens. It says, and not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. First strongholds are Satan's blockages in the atmosphere and the properties of this earth. Okay? When I came here, we had to pray over it, claim it, cast the spirits out in the neighborhood, whatever they practiced ahead of time. It says, cast out the devil. And then speak in tongues or build yourself up in, in the spirit of prayer so that you can deal and do the warfare, you can handle the serpent. Okay, we won't go into any more detail. You getting the idea? God needs you charged up, prayed up. He needs you tuned up so that you're looking up so he can use you in his hands. So you become a weapon. All you do is open your mouth and speak. Hello? And if any man speak, it should be as the oracles of God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to pulling down strongholds. Your mental strongholds, physical strongholds, uh, spiritual strongholds over countries, nations, families, casting down imaginations. How many know that Satan puts imaginations in your mind? Sure. I might have said something to you, for example, and you heard it wrong, and your mind's thinking, why did he say that? How come he did that? I don't understand that. How come I did that? That's a stronghold. That's not God. Spit it out. Throw it down. But we, a lot of us entertain like that. I know there's a time in our lives where God, well, God opened our eye, but we'll see negative. That's not a fault. He wants you to pray about it. Let's get a little mind about it. When you see somebody that's kind of bumping around and really could use some help, instead of saying, gosh, they could use some help, Pray for them. And, and the, so what? So they get the help. Can you say amen? We don't know anybody after the flesh. I'm not looking at all you in the flesh. If I did, I'd have a real bad day. Not because you're so bad. It's because Satan wants our eyes off of God, out of the clouds, out of heaven, getting our wisdom from above, and onto the problems, onto this planet in such a way that it seems to blacken and darken out what we need to hear, what we need to do. Someone say, oh, me. So it says, casting down imaginations, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God's. Go to the next scripture, Ephesians chapter 6. You know this one, verse 10 through 14. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong where? Please. If you haven't prayed up, don't go witnessing. Please. It would help your pastors out. I'm talking about pastors. When you're going to church, please pray up so that we could take you from there up higher. You know, church is not a place to dump your garbage or bring your laundry. Come on, laugh with me. But people do. They go to get a, a freshing charge, and that's okay. We think about that. They could have got a freshing charge from the time they got up in the morning, the time they actually got to church, and if there wasn't anything they're worried about, what are we to do with our worries, everyone? Cast them over on the Lord. Right? What do we do? Listen, I know what the Word says, but how much do we do? This is the key. Don't get under guilt. It's the doing of the word, 
is where you're at. If you're not going any farther than that kind of doing, then that's all you're at. Don't wish you could do it. Don't look at the word through, I wish, I wish, I wish, I, if I only could, I could. Listen, if the nature of our doing and receiving, now listen carefully, if I gave you a million dollars and you, you have never been able to get yourself off of your ground, you need to go to God and get the wisdom to live your life in a good way. But I'm not going to give a million dollars, and God isn't either, to somebody who's a ding-dong. That's somebody, and excuse me for that, that's somebody that won't learn, keeps doing the same thing over and over and over again. Because even if you did give a million dollars, it would help them immediately. But guess what they're going to fall back into? That old habit. We have to change inside. Our habits have to change. Our mannerisms have to change. Why? Because they're holding us back. So you go to God and say, what mannerisms, what things am I doing? And I don't even mentally understand. Just get them out of me. Don't try to understand what they are at first. Get them out of me. Work on me, Lord. I'm chiseled away. And, and diligently pray that way because we have all kinds of blind spots. Listen, if I actually sat down with you and I, and I gave you, you, I love this, and I said to you, just you and I, and I said, hey, I'm me, I'm looking for you to analyze me. How am I doing? Would you really open up and tell me my faults? Now, I'm not asking you that question. And the person will open up. I want to feel secure enough in God that if I had him, there wouldn't be anything bad. Say amen. I mean, I'm not abusive or anything. You, you see what I mean? So we want God to work on chisel those areas out of us so that we're beautiful. Say, I'm beautiful. So, you know, when an artist does something beautiful, God's an artist, and he paints the canvas, first he sees the picture. Then he sees the outline, and he, he romances that picture and outline. You romance the things God told you and that vision and that outline. And see the picture that God's painting before you. It's not all there yet. And then you begin to stroke on the canvas with your prayers and with your thoughts and with the studying of the word. And suddenly the picture begins to come together. And suddenly you begin to see the life set before you. And the more, and you be, and the more you use those strokes, the more influent and the more able to do a more beautiful job. Pretty soon, the face of God's control and his stability and what to do, what not to do, suddenly comes alive, and we begin to understand. And what's before us is a beautiful picture of the will of God for our life. Someone say amen. Ephesians 6, 10. So finally, brethren, by the Lord, uh, uh, by, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Wrong kind of, it really shouldn't say that. The Greek says, allow yourself to go to a place where it's put on you. In other words, when I got my, my wedding, our wedding suit, I had to go get fit. I had to go to, I don't know, men's, I don't want to, in, you know, the men's warehouse or wherever, and you go on, you fit your body, and of course, I was really big back then, 325 pounds, and so they had to fit one on the sumo wrestler, you know. And they got me all looked up. Listen, you're going to the throne room, the fitting room. The way to get the armor on you, the first thing you way you get your armor on, listen, is you say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. You get your own fresh armor. It never leaves you and never forsakes you because the armor is Jesus Christ. He's the shield of faith. He's the breastplate of righteousness. He's the feet shod with the word. Hello. He's holding your life together, belt of truth. Can you say amen? Ladies, your sash, whatever. You know what I mean? The idea is to paint a picture of what God is actually doing. He's enveloped and wrapped around you like armor. Then there's two, mostly one, that's aggressive piece of armor. Can you tell me what that aggressive piece of armor that's a weapon the sword of the spirit, two-edged. It destroys the work of the devil and it heals what he has done. It destroys the work of the devil and it heals what Jesus has done. So listen, Jesus' sword in your mouth, 
through the word, is healing to those who need healing. Health to their flesh. And the sword that you speak out, you don't, you just send it, is destruction to the devil. Why? Because herein the Son of God was manifested, it says in 1 John, to destroy the works of the devil. So when you speak the word, you're speaking Jesus. And Jesus is destroying who? The works of the devil. Now, remember, he's got a, an elaborate computer, Satan does. He stole from God the best. God wants it back. But what the, with that thing that he stole had you and I on the program. You never heard the gospel this way. I'm going to paint it for you. So Satan stole from God when he rebelled as much equipment that he could get. One of them was this massive computer. So the devil's not everywhere present. He has to find things. So he has a little, a little I don't know what you call it, program that listens for key words and habits and habitual practices. And so if somebody as innocent as my wife, she's praying along, and she says, We've lost Linda. She went into the throne room again. And all these ladies went into the throne room again. They're hidden. Well, we got to get them out of there. So he hits his machine. What do we have on her? Okay, we have this from her past, this from her past. But I don't know if that's going to work anymore, Chief, because it's been erased in God's eyes, and he's got shielding on her. He says, that's all right. Everybody gets in the natural and the flesh sometimes. So I want you to know the only way that he appears everywhere and he appears so aggressive is he's got these programs and they're linked up to his system and that's his kingdom. In fact, if you read Ezekiel, I think, or Isaiah, it says when everybody finally ends everything and God puts them before everybody, everybody's going to look and say, is this the one? And I, I used to wonder about that. Did you ever think Satan was something huge and big? And What if that was just a hologram with the fancy equipment? I'm, I'm, I'm tantalizing you to study your Bible, I hope. And look at it with a little more modern eye, practical. And, and that's why he appears this way, because the programming and what he has programmed in, there's just that way. Look at our media. Isn't it programming people, the ding-dongs who's listening to it? And if you know anything about that system, it's been in operation for thousands of years, worked on just about every kind of hum human and whatever they had to program people. Look at what Hitler did. So that's a system of programming. It runs on a massive, massive computer. And one day I'm going to ask God to reveal it to me. If you ever read the book of, Joe, uh, excuse me, book of uh, Enoch, he gets a glimpse of some of this in more detail. Now, I, I don't think the book of Enoch is Bible, but it sure shows us a little more detail on some biblical events. Don't throw it away. You want to know, because Enoch was in the Bible. Jesus quoted from the book of Enoch. So anyway, going past that. Everybody with me? So what is the aggressive weapon that we have of the armor? The sword of the... Spirit, which is the Word of God. All right, let's go to our next point. Speak the Word. You are made to bless, not make a mess. All right. You know I love you dearly, so those who are watching go, is this guy for real? Yes. All right, next one is speak, uh, speak the salty word on the slug. I love that. Is it up there like that? Speak the salty word on the slug. Now, first of all, John 1, 1. Let me quote it for you. In the beginning was the word. Over in 1 John, it says, three the bare record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. So in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So why do we speak the word? Because it is God. God means ultimate, ultimate authority. So you can't separate God from his word in fact, he says he actually honors his word above his name in Psalms 119. Whoa. So that means if God has given his word, Peggy, 
He's going to live or die to keep it. So that's how much rest assured we can believe in the promises in God's word to us. He never changes his mind. It's set. That's why I want to hear you pray. He already knows what he's designed previously when he thought about you before you were created. But he needs you to get to a place to see what it might be. Go to him and we find out. He reveals the, the, the truth to us. And all of a sudden, we just sort of more walk the path than trying to beat the way. The knocking on the door is us beating our way in. It's so that we show interest to really want to know more. Did you get that written down? It's not us to beat the door down. It's us to knock on the door first to even see that we have interest to knock because God has something behind that door. We always look at the negative. No, it's behind the door. And the only way to get past the door is to knock in the name of Jesus. If you're going to find anything, you have to look for it. Seek in you. All right. So, speak the salty word of God. All right. John 1, 1 tells us that God's word is Lord all over everything. Sickness has to obey it. You know, devils have to obey it. Speak the word. Say amen. Then Mark chapter 9, verse 50 says, salt is good. Someone say amen. So, I was finishing on salt. Salt adds flavor. Salt preserves. Salt melts snow, icy hearts. Hello? Salt actually, if you throw it on a fire, it'll actually make the fire hotter. So salt is an ideal term for Jesus to use. I'm sure it does a few other things. This is the one that some people don't understand. How many ever had an open wound and you accidentally put salt in it? What happens? Ah! This is what happens when a person doesn't, with their mouth, be gracious how they speak. You could, somebody could be wounded or broken, and you could flick the wrong salt in their wound. So make sure that our, our conversation be with grace, seasoned with salt. That's what that went over the first scripture, right? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths. Okay, let's go into this. All right, so, nine, so salt is good. But if the salt loses its flavor or saltiness, how will you season it? Have salt in yourself. See what the phrase is? Different. Have salt in yourself. How am I going to, Christy, how am I going to have salt in myself? The word of God. Keep dumping the word in you. I don't understand all that I'm reading. God didn't want you. Just keep feeding the word of God. It's fuel to the fire. It's salt. Not only can it come in you, but it comes out of us. Amen. And when it comes out, it's pretty salty. Be careful how you salt. Say amen. Anybody in authority is already intimidating. You know, if my principal said, Carrie, come to the office. He comes to the office and says, I got a re a, an attaboy and a reward for you. And here I'm thinking, <gasps> See the difference? Old man, new man. All right, let's go on. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Say amen. And if the salt loses its purpose, saltiness, how shall it be seasoned? How is God going to use us if we don't have any word in us? If we don't go to God and get more saltiness, how is he going to use us? God, God your Father loves you so much. But he's not going to take an infant and stick him out for the wolves to eat him. First of all, that infant needs to come to God regular so God builds them up. So no longer are they a child. It's easy to steal candy from a baby. Notice babies don't make adults. Adults make babies. Hello? My job is to produce people and, and, and have people grow. That's my job. Amen? And I hope I'm, you're praying for me. I do a good enough job. But to give you what you need so you can practice it, you see. It's what we practice, what we say that's in line with God that does all the battling for us. How many here saved? Just say, I'm saved in Jesus' name. How many here healed? 
to say, I'm healed in Jesus' name. God healed Christy this morning. She was in a world of pain last night and all. She didn't get a chance to testify, but I, I told her I let her, I'm testifying for her, I forgot. But anyway, wow, she woke up completely healed. Thank you for your prayers. But she knows that God was there. Here's, here's a lot of times what happens to us. We get caught up in the intenseness of the day. We're having fun and everything, but we don't know we're scratching up. And, and so we need to get that refreshing time. We'll get to that later. All right. You still with me? All right. Hebrews chapter 4, 12. What's it say here? For the word of God is living. Never treat your Bible as just words. It's alive. It's Jesus. Jesus, it's the Bible. You can't separate them. And when the Holy Spirit's helping you, if you take a little time to pray, he'll breathe you and lift your thinking so when you do read, it becomes a revelation the way God wants to give it to you. I know a lot of people quote you the Bible, but they have no spirit of God working with them. What do you mean? They're as crabby as the next person. They're nasty. You know, they use the Bible for a defense. Hello? That's trying to pick fruit from thorns and thistles. No, we need to be filled with the Spirit, with the Word. Say amen. And when we do that with the Word, that's how we develop into the fullness of Christ. Yay. That's what I want. I have a long ways to go, but I'm having fun getting there. And know what? Stay within the corral. Don't wander off with the goats. Stay within the corral. Work around the corral, around God and the shepherd. And keep doing that. You watch what happens. You will develop. You'll be solid. You'll be stable. Other Christians who don't do that go, what happened to you? Well, I've been hanging out with Jesus. Well, you're only six months old, Lord, and you know more than I do. Hey, wake up. You're part of the wake up group. Let's wake up. God has so much to share us. What did he say to us this morning, prophetically? So much. Come to me, though. Come to me and pray. I've got so much to share with you. All right. So the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even between our, our thoughts and our intents, between the soul and the spirit. Folks, when you hear soul and spirit, spirit and soul, Everyone say heart. When God talks heart in the Bible, he's talking about both of those. Your soul is the outer, and your spirit man is the inner. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart, you asked him, he came into your inner man, your inner part of your heart. So it's okay to say, God lives in my heart. But the upper outer man of your heart's your head. Now your soul has mind, will, emotions, appetite, intellect, and personality. So that has to be subject to Christ and it has to be flavored by God and his love. Otherwise, we could be quite the personality. We could have a stubborn will in the wrong areas. We can run our own Christianity by the choices we decide to make, go to church when we want to, and the church we want to, where's that going to get us into big trouble eventually? Couldn't God lead somebody like that? You ever try to lead a goat? Can't hint, hint. Don't be a goat. Be a sheep. Amen. It's safe. Be under the shepherd's care. At night, you're in his pen. And you know who's the door? Jesus. He sleeps at the door of our life. Folks, if you know anything in the Old Testament, the sheep were kept in a pen at night so the wolves couldn't sneak in at night or whatever. And the shepherd slept. He was the door. He slept right there. So if anyone wanted to get in, they had to go through the shepherd. Folks, Jesus is our... Hello, do you believe the Bible? Jesus is our shepherd. Who sits at the door of our life? There you go. So that's why we go to him before any major decision to pray. Lord, what do you think? Do you think I should climb over the fence and go over there and hang out with the goats? And most people that do things wrong, they already know it's wrong. That's why they don't pray. Moving right along. <laughs> Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 14. A lot of word today, isn't it? 
Now look at this. this is starting at verse 14. This is a description of Jesus. Paul describes this so the people who were dealing with the Roman Empire and the Roman soldiers would see how protected they were. Now you and I are covered with much more of a modern idea rather than chunky you know, weaponry and heavy armor and all. No, Jesus is very like. You know where he says that? He says, come unto me, my burdens are light. So when we get first born again, everything like it, Jesus comes into our heart, forgives us of our sin, puts his armor on you. Who is Jesus Christ and light? Now our job is to be escorted by the elder Christians to come to church regularly, make sure you're there, and here's the reason, so that they continually have exposure because we need that battery juice to keep the brightness of God's armor lit so that the enemy doesn't even get close to approaching us. Now, I don't know too many Christians like that. I intend to be that way myself. Say amen. How about you? Let me encourage you. It is absolutely possible. You've got the Holy Spirit here to show you. He, he'll line out your steps. The only problem is you are still in some control. Now, I know it's hard to imagine. I want to leap up sometimes and take control. Ah, Carrie. Yeah. No, God has a timing. He has a flow. That's how he protects us. Listen, if God's setting you up for a real blessing, stop trying to make it happen. That was God. I didn't say that. If God is setting you up and he's setting you all up in a wonderful thing, don't get ahead of him. Don't try to make it happen faster. Go with the flow. Say, Lord, I, want, I feel this wanting to hurry and everything. What is that? And then talk to him about it. It's okay. I get it all the time. I, I, sometimes I feel in such a hurry. Listen, you're going to laugh. I only live across the parking lot. I get up in the morning. I get so excited about being with God's people and being in the spirit. There's this wanting to hurry up. No, I just need to walk slowly and contemplate and pray. What do you want said today? You know, this kind of thing. Say so, amen. We all need to slow down. Focus. Look up. Because heavenly mindedness is what we need. Because if we're locked on the earth, locked on why, how come, this kind of thing, then we're locked out of hearing the supernatural realm that we need to hear. And the discourager seems to come around in that realm and always give us discouragement. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No, don't you listen to that. Listen, couples, pray together. The reason a lot of accidents happen in your family is husband and wife don't pray together. Pass that message along. So finally he says, stand therefore. Who we standing in? Who's, who we stand in? God. We're, we're standing in God, folks. Everywhere you go, you're surrounded by God. But you have to acknowledge him. What does that mean? I have to say, God, I know you're here. No, kind of. You have to engage God instead of engaging everything you engage. Well, I still have to do my work and everything. Yeah, but engage God. Lord, Lord I got this project, and I need to get it done quicker so that I'm not stressed out. Could you help me with Now you've engaged God. God says, man, I'm glad you asked. And then he shows you good things, and he begins to line out your life. Much better than having to guess. Here, remember Gideon? If it rains by tomorrow, I know it's your will. No, no, wait a minute. It rains too much in Washington. If it's dry by tomorrow, then I know it's your will. See, that's fleecing God. You never fleece God. You never tell God, if you do this, I'll do that. Uh-uh. Uh, don't ever do that. That's Old Testament foolery. Okay. Nothing against the Old Testament. Just there was a lot of foolerys back then. And they just didn't know God. We get to know God. We have a son in our heart. Can you say amen? Finishing with you. Well, we're salty, right? Okay, so we found out we can speak the word. It's sharp. It's salty. Amen. Therefore, take the helmet of salvation that shields your thinking and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, 
Praying always. I like to reverse them. Always praying. Praying always. Always praying. Why? This is being in prayer in season, out of season. This is being instant in prayer. What do you mean? Well, how many times have you dimmed down the road and you saw something you went, oh, Lord, help them. That's being in season. That's, that's being instant in prayer. That's what he's talking about here. When I, Linda and I hear a fire engine or an aid wagon, first thing I say, Lord, be with them that are going to help. Be with the ones that needing the help. Match them together and go right in the middle of that situation and take over in Jesus' name. See, that's being instant in prayer. Why? Because God might need you to invite them in on their behalf. But see, you don't do that every time. You can't remember to do that every time. Wait for the Holy Spirit to tug and poke at you to do it. Can you say amen? Why? He, everything God does with you is a lesson of learning and growing, Mike. Everything God does for you is a lesson of learning and growing. Mom will pass that on to you. Everyone will say, thank God he's finishing. <laughs> That's a statement of faith. Here we go. All right. First of all, let me just say this. Point one. Let us remind everyone that Jesus is in full authority. And you say, well, how come it doesn't look like it? Because the earth, we have to put him in charge. We have to bring God and put him in charge. Notice God didn't become in charge of your life until you asked him to become. Amen? And then the enemy, if we listen to him, he'll, he'll teach you how to take it back from him. Okay. Hello? But we did give the Lord charge of our life, right? So if you let him be in charge of your life, you'll find that's exactly true. Say amen. He's in charge. But we have a will. Anytime we want to jump out of that car, we can so the will of God is us doing his will in the earth, letting Jesus be in charge. So as you pick up and gain speed, and you get older in the Lord, you're picking up, you went from 25 miles an hour, now you're going to 30, on to 40. You don't want to have some nasty will and get mad at somebody and open the door and leap out. And that's where a lot of Christians are. They're traveling and thinking they're doing all this, but their maturity is... <laughs> They're easily offended. They're jumping out of the will of God, in the will of God. I see some not here today. It's not their fault necessary. Maybe it is. Because how can God get them to grow and develop? He's got to incubate us. He's got to get us to be still. He has to work the depth in us. In order for that to do, we have to trust him. We have to trust him to allow ourselves to relax and let him operate. Say Amen. All right? When we fight against the enemy, we fight the devil from the throne room. Say amen. Learn there's a time to fight, a time to rest. Most intercessors I've trained through the years, done seminars, is they get battle weary because they're taking authority of this. Everybody's giving them things to pray for, him, which is good. But too much warring will make you weary, even spiritual warring. So you go in, say, Lord, guide me into my prayers today. You begin to pray, and you begin to war. And where are you warring from? You're warring from the throne room of God. With God's equipment and his word, say amen. amen. Then when you're done, here's what you do. Watch me. Lord, cleanse me from all of the battle stuff, all the smoke and all the excitement. And I cast it over, and Lord, I step back in you, and I lift my hands, I worship, rejuvenate me. Ah, oh, Lord, thank you. Glory to God. And then he comes back, and he refills you up, and boom, go throughout your day. You're not in a battle every day if you are somebody's deceiving you. Hello? There's only one Savior, and you're not it. You're kind of like a helper, but you can't save the world, right, Linda? We've tried. Not just you, me too. <laughs> you know. How many know you can't make a person do something? You see, I'm convinced that people go to church, but they don't hear anything. They agree, and it's good, and it's wonderful. Now, this is not a put down. This is reality. Jesus said, if you have ears, hear. He must have said that for a reason. Make sure that how you hear. And what you listen to. In Proverbs, it talks a whole lot about having ears to hear. If you listen to me, how you'll dwell safely. 
But the church is having a problem listening to the shepherd. We want them all to get back there. So the first call to get ourselves tuned up is to God. Say amen. Every day, consistently, out of your spirit, man, sincere, provocative, heartfelt prayer, a righteous man or woman avails much. If you got something out of that this morning, will you give the Lord a hand clap? <laughs>